So good evening, everyone. Uh, as everybody is already aware, uh, this month, October, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And as uh, you know, we should always be aware about breast cancer, but we put an additional focus on it during this month. Uh, Two lakh persons in India typically get diagnosed with breast cancer every year. And while the overall incidence rate seems to be lower than uh, the global incidence rates, the outcomes are definitely still poorer. Uh, so today we discuss the challenges that are there in terms of early diagnosis and treatment, especially because everybody knows that early diagnosis improves chances of survival uh, as well as quality of outcomes. Um, so let's talk. We have a very distinguished panel today with us. Uh, we've got uh, Urvi Sabnis, uh, who, uh, you know, followers of patients engage know she has been an active patient advocate. She's herself a breast cancer survivor and a caregiver. We've got Dr. Jadunath uh, Buragahen from Gohati Nemcare Hospital. We've got Yashv Dr. Yashwan Kashyap from uh, NHMMI Hospital, Raipur. We've got I think Dr. Kalita is still not joined us, but hopefully will join in a bit. He's from Gohati, Dr. Jyoti Gupta Anand, Yashoda Cancer Hospital, Ghazibad, and Dr. Sharad Chandra from Medicover Cancer Hospital, Hyderabad. A uh, quick reminder to people who are new to us, Patients Engage is an online platform for patients dealing with chronic diseases. Uh, their patients and their family members share experiences, plus we put out curated evidence-based information. Our basic perspective is that people who are better informed are likely to take better decisions and uh, uh, end up with better outcomes as far as disease management is concerned. And we also put a lot of emphasis on lived experiences of people so that people know that they are not dealing with the condition alone. Um, there's a whole bunch of content and we won't go into it because we have a lot to cover today, but you can find a lot of the content on our previous, on the website, as well as on our uh, social media pages. So um, again, a quick uh, guidance, the views expressed in the video and in the conversations are of the panelists. They are only intended to spread, spread general awareness and may not necessarily reflect of the platform. Uh, they do not replace a medical consultation. So please do consult your doctor for your specific medical issues and you can post your questions. We are live on, uh, because the event is sponsored by Biocon. Uh, so we are live on uh, the Biocon pages uh, as well as uh, Patients Engage pages, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Biocon LinkedIn, as well as uh, yeah, Biocons, uh, Facebook and YouTube. Um, so post your questions and we will try and address them now or later. And as always, you can check our website at www.patientsengage.com. So as I said, we have a really uh, excellent panel out there and I am Aparna Mittal. I'm the founder of Patients Engage. So let's get started. I'll just stop sharing. Um, so Dr. Jyoti, we'll start with you. Um, let's make sure that we are on the same page. So you know, if you can tell people what is breast cancer and what are the symptoms, typical symptoms of breast cancer. Hi, Aparna. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I think this is a very good effort from Bi uh, Biocon um, to create such awareness and which is a live program in which we can, uh, in, in which audience can put their questions and make it more interactive. So talking about breast cancer, breast cancer is any type of cancer is abnormal proliferation or abnormal multiplication of normal cells of our body. And they, uh, they form a lump inside the organ, like in breast cancer, they form a lump uh, inside the breast and then they uh, create symptoms. And if we talk about what are the symptoms of breast cancer, so most common symptom is breast lump. Most of the patients, uh, they come with breast lump. Sometimes they come with lump in their axilla because uh, breast uh, cancer then spreads to axillary lymph nodes. And uh, other symptoms which they can come across, it can be... Uh, uh, their skin changes, uh, they can have uh, scaly skin, they can have uh, orange-like skin, which we call as beauty orange, and they can have nipple changes, which in which uh, they can have retraction of nipple, uh, uh, shape, shape in, uh, change in shape of both the breast, it is uh, in a finding which can be, uh, which is noticeable, 
and uh, sometimes we, they can have nipple discharge but nipple discharge doesn't mean that all patients have cancer because many times patient come to me with history of nipple discharge it is whitish in color which is normal in reproductive age group but if the nipple discharge is reddish and it's associated with the lump associated with skin changes it can be a symptom of uh, breast cancer and uh, i will not uh, uh, forget here aparna uh, to mention that uh, most of these lumps are painless uh, patients come that kabhi dard hi nahi hota tha uh, painless hone ka matlab ye nahi hai ki it is not a cancer actually most of the breast cancer lumps are painless they become painful at later stages and in later stages uh sometimes patient does not have a uh, primary breast lump but patient can present with distant metastatic symptoms like bony pains and headaches and all that so uh, anything which is abnormal which does not fit into your routine please don't ignore those symptoms right thank you um and dr jadunath what are the risk factors of breast cancer yeah good evening everyone now uh, this uh, more than 50% of uh, patient with breast cancer sometimes we may not be able to get any risk factor other than the female gender and increase in age the this uh, out of uh, uh, breast cancer is com- common as any it's a female um, basically female gender it occurs in so out of 100 if you consider 99% occurs in female and male it is only 1% so basically it's a kind of disease which is related to hormone okay so uh like early menarche and the late menopause that is one right. of the risk factor so this gives persistent exposure to estrogen basically estrogen and progesterone are female hormone so those basically uh, uh risk factors so uh, not having child as a it's a, again a kind of uh, risk factor again Uh, if there is uh, let conceive if someone is conceiving in the age of 30 years if, if one lady is conceiving at 20 years at 20 years the lady who is conceiving she will have less chances of having malignancy than having in uh, in uh, 30 years like that so there are some causes like uh, familial causes are there so the 5 to 10% of breast cancer may be there may be a familial predisposition and if there is earlier there is uh, some exposure to radiation so previous history of radiation is there like that but mostly there is because of this uh, hormone related suppose nowadays what is happening now uh, our girls are they are getting early menarche and then late menopause that is one of the risk factor because right. uh, yeah change of lifestyle change is one basically is a uh, major factor where our we are having like western lifestyle nowadays slowly and slowly and urban population they are getting more breast cancer then the earlier cervix cancer used to be higher in a part of country but slowly slowly now breast cancer is increasing because of the change of lifestyle like mm. breast breast feeding now breast feeding is also a protective for the lady so right someone is uh, not i mean because of her professional career may not be able to feed the baby for a long time so that is the one reason of uh, one increasing risk so earlier what used to happen a mother used to feed baby for one year two year three years like that so that kind of protection is now it is missing so that is changing of lifestyle obesity is little bit not that obesity has little bit other than that uh, there is uh, not much uh, significant risk factor only okay. mostly is, yeah thank you thank you dr jadnath um dr kashyap are you there uh, yes ma'am yes. yeah so um just wanting to understand if you look at the best practices to improve early diagnosis what are considered the best practices uh, ma'am uh, like screen uh, routine screen like screening for high risk patient like right. uh, european guidelines uh, prefer that uh, women after 45 year of age we should be doing annual to biannual mammography screening right. mammography diagnostic right. mammography and in other cases uh, sometimes uh, ultrasound and mri can be used so right. that is the practice second thing that uh, patient who are high risk due to family history or uh, due to uh, prior exposure to radiation such group should be screened hmm. uh, these are the 
common practice that uh, we should be doing for right. uh, early diagnosis. And any suspicious lump uh, based on sonography, that should be uh, because we generally used to say triple test. Triple right. test uh, our clinical examination, then mammography and histology. That should be done. What we have seen that many a time we are just doing FNAC and uh, if it turns out to be negative, we are uh, just leaving the patient. So in suspicious cases, biopsy should be also done. Four biopsies, which is readily feasible. Right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kashyap. Um, Urvi, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, you had cancer, breast cancer a few years back. So if you can tell us when and how did you, what were your first symptoms and how did you get diagnosed? And were you aware of screening guidelines before the diagnosis? Uh, good evening, everyone. I was uh, detected with uh, second stage of breast cancer in uh, January 2015. I did not have any symptoms, but uh, like I had many, a few cases in my paternal side of the family. So I was very alert and I used to get my mammography done every two years. And uh, I found out in that during one of those checkups that I right. had breast cancer. Yeah. Right. And I know that you are a very active advocate for screening. Um, uh, sorry, before that, were you also aware of uh, self-breast exam? Did you do that? I know you did memo, but... Yeah, actually, I was not... I was aware about self-exam, but I was not aware about the method of it. So randomly, I used to do. But now I feel that what I was doing was not the correct way to do. Right, right. Um, I think that's also an important point because we keep telling people self-breast exam, but very few, I think now at least thanks to social media, there are a few videos of people showing how it needs to be done. Um, and you advocate for screening uh, in your experience by talking to you know the public or patients, etc. What are the common reasons you come across for not doing a self-exam or, or going for regular screening? So uh, when it goes uh, like for a self-exam, I would say that in certain classes, there is still a taboo to talk about breast. Mm. So yeah, in certain group of people, I've, uh, women, I've seen that when we talk about breast, like 10 out of 50 uh, would be attentive. Other, others are looking here and they, they are not comfortable talking about uh, breast. Uh, the other thing which the reason which I've heard is uh, that they say that we have space constraint. So when the, you say that stand in front of a mirror, we don't have that kind of uh, privacy, privacy in our um, house. Oh. So, it is, mm. yeah, yeah. so we don't have this, uh, we do, can't do this. Uh, one thing would be like health is not a priority. Mm. Um, that is also, uh, yeah, one reason major, I would say that is a very big reason. Big reason. Across all the, yeah, across all the classes, I would say. Uh, uh, then denial, this cannot mm. happen to me. Mm. Uh, that is also a thing. Uh, right. When we talk about uh, mammography, again, denial and priority. Mm. And, uh, definitely there. Since the, the, there are no cases in my family, it cannot happen to me. That is also a myth. Uh, financial constraints. Right. Right. Then when there's one more myth that uh, these mammographies are uh, very painful mm. or these are invasive pro uh, procedures. People are not aware about the exact procedures. So uh, that is also one of the reasons. Mm. One more reason which, yeah, people, uh, women are scared of the outcome. Mm. So they try to, like, you know, turn a blind eye. I don't right. want to go. What if right. it turns out to be positive? Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think, things. correct. I mean, everybody knows fear of missing out, but fear of finding out is also very correct. high in, yes. uh, in health uh, matters. Um, so I, I think to, uh, to all of you, uh, Dr. Sharat, uh, Chandra, if we will start with you, um, you know, I think Urvi is already, uh, Urvi has already talked about some of the issues on screening, etc. But in your experience, what are the reasons for delays in the diagnosis as well? Uh, 
So I think uh, Mrs. Surve has rightly pointed out uh, from the uh, general public point of view what are all the uh, myths or the fears which uh, uh, all the pa pa patients and people have on their minds uh, before uh, getting on to some imaging uh, like uh, mammograms. So uh, uh, the a point which I would like to stress is uh, the uh, particular guidelines and the awareness programs which uh, should be uh, taken out uh, more into the public are not being done like the way they are uh, intended to uh, from the government's uh, point of view. And mm -hmm. uh, also the lack of uh, availability of facilities in the most of the uh, uh, rural areas of India where almost 80 to 90 percent of uh, population cater to, they do not have any access to, uh, let's say, a mammogram or uh, uh, in that case, any uh, general uh, breast cancer awareness program. So they're not even awareness of, uh, they're not even aware of any particular program or a mammogram uh, which could be done to uh, pick it up at an early rate. So right. uh, it is uh, 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 on a broader perspective, maybe uh, the government or the oncological uh, society should come up with uh, better guidelines to uh, take this idea more into the public, more into the rural areas. The uh, urban areas are better off, uh, I feel, uh, but the rural uh, population are still way lagging behind in in terms of uh, awareness, in terms of uh, early uh, diagnosis, or in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, just uh, an availability of an oncologist uh, at one particular area. So I think uh, these are the areas which uh, uh, maybe government should take initiative and uh, stress a little more because in the Western world, I think uh, the best cancer awareness and the screening guidelines are uh, very well managed and they are deeply rooted into the society. So okay. we should uh, uh, begin our awareness programs not after uh, uh, we reach into our uh, 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 adult, uh, once you reach adults, I think we should start uh, these programs maybe at the uh, uh, school level only. So right. then uh, our uh, females are better educated and then, you know, by the time they reach uh, this particular age, uh, the fears of talking about uh, this particular symptoms or uh, usage of the word of breast or breast cancer is at least uh, off by then. Right. So that's what I feel. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharat. Uh, Dr. Kalita, are you there now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, if you can turn on your video. Thank you. Uh, would you like to add anything in terms of the reasons for delays in uh, diagnosis or the challenges uh, associated? Yeah, all the salient points uh, has, uh, has been highlighted. So what is uh, the, the, I just want to highlight is the lack of uh, good screening facilities, good screening program and uh, availability of the laboratories and the radiological diagnosis in most of the rural parts of our India, not only in our part, but uh, it is uh, it is almost uh, the scenario is similar, I think, in all of India. Right. And, uh, and over and above, uh, above that, uh, there is no any uh, 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 curriculum or there is no any textbook about uh, what uh, in, in the school level or in or uh, in the high secondary level then the women should be taught uh, so what are the signs of the breast cancer how it can be diagnosed at an early stage so this uh, i think it's it's high time that we include all these things also into our curriculum so right. then only i think that uh, it uh, it will be the picture will be better in a few years right right uh, Dr. Jyoti, one of the things that I remember talking to a couple of patients was also um, the gender of the uh, staff in screening facilities. So, um, you know, that even in uh, for mammogram, for instance, the lab technicians are all male, uh, for instance, and uh, uh, and also, you know, even for a clinical breast exam, unless they do go back to their uh, gynae, uh, it tends to be male as well. So um, is that a factor that you think makes a difference? And, you know, do we need to see what can be done on that as well? Yes. And if 
we talk about India, yes, it's definitely a factor. Like Urviji said that uh, breast, uh, talking about breast is still a taboo in our country. So it is a factor if you talk about uh, uh, low socioeconomic status, especially I will say. And in rural areas, patients or uh, females are generally not very comfortable if they are being uh, examined by a male doctor. They don't have female staff. That's why the uh, concept of uh, being one female attendant along with a male uh, doctor came into being uh, but i think we should uh, come above it uh, we should look uh, move forward and what is important is our health and uh, uh, who is examining me and uh, uh, what will be the result i i i'm not comfortable with him being uh, examining me so i think uh, it should be out of our dictionary now right um and and uh, dr jarnath uh, you know, sometimes we also have this as we as we talked of the fear of finding out. So one of the issues that people worry about is that if it's cancer, it will be very expensive, the cost uh, as well, or you know, it it's a difficult thing. So that's one of the reasons why people put off uh, even screening. Uh, is that uh, kind of you know something you've come across, or you don't think that's an issue anymore? Regarding this. Uh... I mean, screening and all is, I don't think that cost is an issue, I mean, uh, for people, but for treatment part is definitely uh, cost factor is there. But nowadays, this a uh, lot of schemes are available even in a government hospital also. You get chemotherapy right. free, free, you get radiotherapy free. But many people, they are not aware of that also that you get free treatment, free quality treatment. Right. But mostly what I think that uh, definitely mammography will help, but our uh, incidence in, of our breast cancer in India is not that high as like uh, Western countries. But if you can detect this clinically palpable lesion, that also will make a lot of difference. See, most of the time we get uh, locally advanced breast disease. If you mm. can diagnose one centimeter or two centimeter of disease also, that can make a, a lot of difference. So right. the people should be aware, they should do breast uh, self-examination monthly at least, and they should pick up, if there is any lesion, they should do all the investigation until and unless proven it, that it is not malignant. So my point is that people, we have to create awareness and then regular breast self-examination, at least they should feel, they should know which part of the breast like what. They should be able to compare what it was before and what it is presently. And right. we have to give more importance in the breast self-examination, I think. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kashyap, uh, you know, we talked of screening, uh, but do we have, because it's sometimes you also find that people will get screening, but then they won't, uh, you know, take action based on that screening, right? Because sometimes you, you do actually have a lot of initiatives like mobile vans, et cetera, that go periodically to uh, rural areas and uh, conduct screening camps. But then, you know, do we have any data which say what percentage of that actually follows through and gets to a proper diagnostic and then a treatment? Uh, Ma'am, uh, in uh, I have seen around 20 to 30 percent of attrition. And mm. one more thing I want to differ from Jaduna that most of our patients are locally advanced. Apart from breast, they are detecting early, but due to many a time in uh, I know it is prevalent in affordable class also and in poor person also. I have seen uh, some kind of ignorance or denial. That's why our most of our 60 to 70 percent patients are stage uh, three onwards. Right. So we are detecting India, in India we are detecting uh, much higher grade tumors, more right. aggressive because our patient, uh, our females are somehow more tolerant or negligent, uh, whatever we can say. So that is also reflecting in screening. Even after diagnosing, many patients are defaulting. They are not completing therapy, even with uh, uh, so many schemes and many things coming up. Though government is not that much admit uh, for cancer, like for other things, but still uh, there is main, uh, lots of uh, like negligence from our part also. Our... Right. I guess negligence is a very strong word, but uh, I guess it's, you know, as Urviji said, it's about priority and obviously the priority is a bit less. Uh, anything else that Dr. Sharath or Dr. Kalita, you'd like to add to this point? No. 
Okay. Um, Urvi ji, in your experience as a counselor, uh, what are the common reasons for, as we said, you know, that they go through a screening and then uh, either, you know, I think you've talked of, for instance, people don't want to do a biopsy or uh, they are kind of don't want to do all of the proper diagnostic processes, et cetera. So, you know, what are the common reasons that you've come across in your experience as a patient counselor? Uh, first and foremost, again, big denial that the report is not correct. This mm. cannot happen to me. And then regarding biopsy, yeah, there is a myth that if you get a biopsy done, the cancer cell cells spread faster. Mm. So there comes a big resistance, and there we need to counsel a lot to let them, uh, you know, think and go uh, go ahead. Uh, these are the two things I can find like, for diagnostic things. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, Dr. Jyoti, I think we talked about this briefly as well, but, um, and, and, you know, I think we'll want to take the view of pretty much most of you on this because we want to get a holistic view across the country. When we looked at, for instance, the Ayushman Bharat data, we found that uh, for a lot of the package consumption data that, you know, that talks of, uh, there was uptake for surgery, but then the subsequent treatment uptake was uh, very low or, you know, clearly not 100% uh, and quite actually significantly lower. So in your experience, uh, you know, why is that, uh, um, you know, and what do you think are the possible reasons for it? We'll start with you, Dr. Jyoti. Uh, Aparna, um, see, Ajushman Bharat is a very new scheme. Mm. Right, and uh, we all know that Ayushman Bharat for cancer is not uh, being adopted by most of the hospitals. There are hardly one or two hospitals in Delhi, and said if I talk about who have Ayushman Bharat for cancer, so that is the uh, uh, now here comes the priority, you know, which Ruji is talking about. Now, uh, patients get the surgery done. Uh, they don't know what is the uh, what is the like uh, utility of further treatment. Mm -hmm. How will it impact their life if they will not get the further treatment done? So now, according to them, they have taken one part of the treatment, and I think it is sufficient. Cancer ko to maine nikali diya hai. Ab body mein cancer hi nahi. Ab kya rehe hai? Kya apne surgery kiya hai? Cancer ko apne nikal diya hai. So why should I take further treatment? So this is one of the reason if we talk about Ayushman Bharat data. But yes, uh, if we uh, leave this thing apart, uh, patients have generally uh, uh, like uh, hesitation for going through chemotherapy as we all know for much known side effects of chemotherapy like nausea, vomiting, hair loss. But as a medical oncologist, nausea and vomiting, uh, they're very uh, less common. Only few genes are highly emetogenic, which we talk. And in today's practice, we have very good anti-emetogenic drugs uh, like anti-MSS uh, treatment, which we give prior to chemotherapy, post-chemotherapy, which decrease the risk of nausea and vomiting. And hair loss, if we talk here, skin and nail changes, they are, they are all reversible changes on this platform i would like to tell the general population they are all reversible changes you will get your hair back your nails and skin uh, discoloration will go with time after you are treatment free but uh, these are um, most common hesitations which a patient um, actually fee feels or go goes through whenever we talk about treatment and uh, one more thing the, uh, there is a misconception that chemotherapy is like cobra uh, so this is a very uh, common myth. Uh, like So uh, I think uh, this which should be taken uh, consideration. Okay. All right. I, I had not heard of this Cobra Ka Zahir, but Urvi is, is nodding very vigorously. She, she's clearly heard this. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any other myths that anybody would like to address? Because I think it's a good uh, time if uh, you know if we will go around and any other points on uh, you know uh, the fears associated with the uh, non surgical aspects of uh, or any sometimes you may find some patients don't want surgery but so far we've not come across that it's mainly they are okay with surgery but they are concerned about the other treatments so uh, dr kashyap would you have anything that you would want to talk about or you know any myth that you want to address like ma'am said, uh, that Jahar point is right. So some patients say this. And also uh, some patients like correlate with uh, earlier time. 
that someone has family has received or someone nearby has received and died like that mm. the, this is the one of myth then uh, hair loss and other factor also there there is some myth but uh, slowly like uh, dr jyoti said that things are improving we have better drug so we are uh, getting through but there are still lots of myths are going on uh, mm. regarding uh, how chemotherapy is given what will be the, uh, uh, they will administer some red toxic like that myths are going for different patients right so yes, um, no, one minute just uh, regarding sure. this uh, patient taking a sur- considering surgery and not going for radiotherapy or chemotherapy i agree with the previous speaker's point but uh, it's depend uh, actually i uh, mostly it's counseling actually so mm. if you can tell them the benefit of uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy and most of the people i think will agree very few people is there who disagree right 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 um so um okay uh, i was about to ask something um yeah uh, dr kalita if you can also explain to the audience because i think sometimes there is this whole confusion they say we don't know what is chemotherapy right what will happen so there is i think with radiation now there is a concept they vaguely know that you know there's a machine involved etc but with chemotherapy actually we find that people have all kinds of notions on it so if you can tell us what are the types of chemotherapy broadly and you know what happens because people don't understand there's oral chemotherapy there is iv etc right so if you can just talk through that very briefly yeah <clears throat> so people uh, uh, after surgery uh, there is always an apprehension uh, regarding uh, the uh, uh, why we should go for chemotherapy surgery mm. so tumor has been removed so what is the benefit what i will get the benefit the tumor is not there the disease is not there so why i should go for the chemotherapy why i should go for the toxic drug is it it will be beneficial for me if, if uh, right. i will be i will be uh, um, having the hair loss will will i get my hair back then uh, i will be having uh, difficult time so weakness nausea vomiting neuropathy all these symptoms so people are always apprehensive of going for chemotherapy so especially it is very much uh, essential to uh, make the people understand sit with the patient talk with the patient so regarding uh, and another uh, great issue uh, uh, is the fertility so fertility is a right. uh, major issue for uh, for the women so uh, so these things has to be so their query has to be uh, answered so it has to be discussed in thorough with the patient before going for the chemotherapy and once we go mm-hmm. and once we discuss all the details about the chemotherapy what are the regimen how many cycle you have to receive what are the frequency what are the drugs what may be the complications so how, how uh, we should tackle it so what are the uh, the rescue medication so all these things has to be uh, uh, discussed in thorough with the patient before going for chemotherapy and i think uh, most of the patients uh, uh, the jadu sir has already uh, uh, already talked that if you can uh, discuss in detail with the patient i think most of the patient will understand uh, the gravity of the situation and the need for the chemotherapy but it is very uh, very essential to discuss with the patient why we should go for the chemotherapy so thank you uh, yeah thank yeah. you dr kalita uh, dr sharath chandra um, we've received a question and maybe you can take this one as well uh, which is more reliable mammography or ultrasound examination of breasts and while we are at it if you can also answer the question on thermal screening so i think uh, which is more reliable i think uh, it depends on case to case basis uh, uh, on a broader perspective maybe uh, the mammogram is the one uh, which we rely on more as part of a screening program and most of the uh, abnormalities uh, like architectural distortions or uh, uh, calcifications are picked up by mammogram when compared to ultrasound ultrasound uh, per se has its uh, benefits in specific cases like uh like let's say in a young uh, with a very dense uh, breast uh, you will how to correlate it with the ultrasound sometimes uh, it is an adjunct uh, it is more like an adjunct i think mammogram and ultrasonography both uh, 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 
will go in tandem uh, in delineating the scoring by red scoring of a particular lesion but then uh, on a broader perspective maybe uh, the mammogram is a little more reliable when we when you don't have an ultrasound if you uh, have an ultrasound as an adjunct i think uh, at our center uh, uh, during screening also uh, they correlate uh, mammograph uh, mammographic findings along with an ultrasound also but if that is not available yes mammogram is uh, definitely on any day more reliable than ultrasound but ultrasound has its uh, uh, uses in specific cases like uh, we just mentioned right so uh ah uh, yeah yeah okay uh there's also a question i don't know who wants to take this do detection of early stage biomarker breast cancer be a good initiative other than mammogram anybody has a view on this I I think there have yeah. been enough uh, trials uh, which were done on uh, uh, picking up uh, breast cancer using biomarkers but then there is no constructive data as as such uh, uh, which has beaten uh, mammograms or ultrasounds as of uh, today uh, there are uh, two specific uh, biomarkers like ca15.3 and 27.7 but then uh, we generally don't use it on a daily or a routine basis uh, maybe uh some uh, sometimes uh, there are uh, cases where we follow it uh, in uh, stage 4 or uh, or so but then uh, the general usage is very low and there have been enough uh, uh, trials which were done where uh, they were not uh, that beneficial when compared to uh, all these imaging modalities right right thank you um doctor uh, i guess we can go to dr kashyap on this uh, is uh, mbc uh, either as someone's first diagnosis or recurrence after treatment for earlier stage breast cancer is that curable uh, uh, as sorry I mbc say, is metastatic breast cancer for our audience yes, yeah yes yes uh, ma'am i think cure is a term uh, that we should uh, now i think we are focusing non not on survivor only for other patient also now we have so many molecules in our armamentarium that right. compared to other disease our patients are now uh, living longer with better quality of life and with different schemes and even with ayushman bharat mm. now our patients are able to afford that also so right. uh, uh, per se i will say still i will say that mbc with one subset like oligometastasis breast cancer they are still to a curable but controllable is better term but right. still uh, uh, breast cancer is a disease that we have so many drugs which with which we are able to give uh, good uh, control of even in hormone positive and even in r2 positive sur- uh, five years sur- uh, even we have achieved survival of 56 60 months like that so right. that is very remarkable feat compared to less than one year uh, which was uh, 20 year earlier so Uh, still mbc is not curable but apart from cure there are many other aspect which we as medical oncologists and the panel we address. right right yeah i think we would want to highlight that you know we have come across patients who do live for quite a few years uh, on treatment of mbc as well so uh, you know the there is uh, longer lives uh, Uh, now after even after an mbc diagnosis um dr jyoti um i think we received a question on recurrence as well if you can talk a little bit about i think one of the fears that always comes up for patients is uh, the fear of recurrence so do we have data as to what percentage of you know kind of uh, breast cancer patients will have recurrence and uh, or a relapse and uh, uh, is there anything that can be done to prevent that Um, we see whenever we talk about recurrences uh, there are risk factors which have such patients have higher rates of recurrences like uh, 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 more stage stages of disease like in stage three stage four as we go higher in stage the rates of recurrence increases uh, this is one of the risk factors uh, node positivity is one of the risk factor which increases the uh, ch- chances of the disease being recurrent and, right uh, 
node positivity, tumor, tumor biology, like we all say that hormone positive tumors, they behave well as compared to uh, tumors who are HER2 positive or who are triple negative. So this is one, uh, again, uh, uh, risk factor for higher risk cancer rate. But uh, despite all these uh, factors which have proven uh, things like uh, recurrences can be there, we have seen patients uh, who are on adjuvant treatment and still they develop progressive disease while on treatment and we have seen triple negative breast cancers who are behaving very well, they are living up to years and in those cases after 5 years of or 10 years of uh, disease risk interval, we call them as a second primary. So uh, talking about recurrences, it depends upon patient to patient, tumor biology and many other factors which decides about the recurrence of the disease. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's look at, you know, what steps need to be taken now, right? So we'll go around again on this one. Uh, Dr. Sharat uh, Chandra, what are the steps that need to be taken to improve, uh, uh, you know, treatment adherence uh, and uh, uh, even access to treatment? Treatment adherence, I think uh, uh, it is more uh, related uh, to the patient and the doctor connect. I think uh, uh, once they latch on to, to the doctor and uh, his particular uh, uh, way of uh, treating, I think uh, we pull most uh, patients uh, towards the end of the treatment. Uh, 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 sometimes uh, uh, due to some particular unavoidable reasons like financial crisis or maybe... Uh, uh, a chemo related toxicity or uh, some unavoidable issue in the family uh, some uh, some odd patient may drop off uh, uh, midway or uh, one way or the other but then uh, it all depends on uh, the doctor and the patient's relationship uh, primarily and then uh, you know uh, uh, some patients uh, drop off due to financial reasons and then some patients may not initiate treatment uh, because uh, uh, their particular uh, 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 health scheme has no uh, access to this particular uh, treatment. Uh, I think uh, 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 these things uh, needs to be addressed uh, uh, to pull uh, uh, more patients towards the end of the treatment. Right, right. Um... Uh, we've got a couple of more questions come in, but we'll just finish this. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jadunath, what, you know, what are the steps that need to be taken to improve access to or to improve early diagnosis? Yeah, uh, I already I have uh, told like for early diagnosis, most important is the awareness. And right. definitely patient, uh, people who can afford, definitely we, could, we, can, we should consider for mammography. Right, and then access also that is also awareness about, about about the availability of treatment. Patients should know that this kind of autolomy or Iusman discards are available for poor patient. I'm telling, and the other also that access uh, is definitely an issue. But awareness is the main point. They should have the health education. They should know that this kind of facility, this kind of treatment is available. And then the one thing I just want to mention about the adherence of treatment, completion of the treatment. One, once apart from the financial part, once the disease is diagnosed, then we have to discuss uh, in detail. We have to give that roadmap. This, this much of chemotherapy will be required uh, either before surgery or after surgery, six or eight cycle. Yeah, you have to mention about the how many days of gaps you are going to give. After that, the patient will be requiring surgery, you have to tell. And then if there is a requirement of radiotherapy. So everything we have to explain, we have to sit with the patient and the attendant. And then we have to give them entire details that after this time only, that there will be completion of the treatment. And then again, subsequently, follow-up also will be required. We have to tell them. So right. then I think that patient, otherwise what happened, patient sometimes will come after surgery, three, four months after surgery. Well, nobody told us about this, that I need chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So once it is diagnosed, that we have to give detail that after surgery, you have this, this, this treatment, you have to come. At least they should volunteer and come for the remaining treatment. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Kalita, if you're still there, we've just received a couple of questions. So... Where does breast cancer spread? Uh, you know, which organs does it typically spread into? And uh, there's actually one other question. Um, is, is breast cancer more common in one of the breasts? In left or right? Dr. Kalita, are you there? 
Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so regarding the first question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, regarding the first question, so it can uh, metastasize to possibly to any organ. But if you uh, tell me the particular which organ are affected most, so we can uh, tell that uh, the liver is one of the organ that is commonly metastasized. The, right. the, uh, and after after that, the triple negative breast cancer or HER2 positive breast cancer has a more propensity to go to the brain. So the so brain match is very much common, especially with the triple negative breast cancer. Apart from that, the bone metastasis is very much uh, common. Then adrenal gland may be involved. Ovary, ovary uh, the uh, adnexal mass uh, we commonly see, especially uh, especially with the uh, uh, with bo uh, with the breast cancer, so these right. are the commonly the, the sites of uh, involvement. And regarding the second question, I forgot what was. Uh, is it more common in you know which breast, uh, left breast, right breast? Is there any yeah, such particularly? Data? Yeah, theoretically, it is said that uh, the, the so there is some. Uh, Left breast is more involved than the right, but the, we have not seen any such uh, differentiation. We have got uh, almost similar cases okay. affected with left or right breast. Right, right. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Urvi, from a patient perspective or a patient advocate perspective, what do you think needs to be done to improve, uh, you know, early diagnosis uh, and treatment, access to treatment? I think all the points are covered, like uh, access and awareness. These are the thing, two things as per. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Uh, so thank you very much. I'll just do one round. If you know, you can leave, each of you can leave with a couple of sentences to the audience as to what is the most uh, uh, important thing that they should take away from this session. So I'll start with you, Dr. Jyoti. Uh, the most important thing that somebody who's listening should take away from this session? The most important thing that we should not fear from the diagnosis of breast cancer, uh, come forward, get yourself checked, even if you're diagnosed like OBG that was diagnosed as stage 2 because she went for a regular screen screening examination. That was uh, why she was diagnosed in stage 2 and she is a survivor. She got cured. But if we uh, if will not diagnose the disease in early stages at on right time, they will be uh, diagnosed at later stages and leading to higher, higher of mortality, which is what happening in our country. Come forward, get yourself tested, go for regular screening tests, whatever is advisable and uh, get cured if you get the disease. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sharath? I think uh, <clears throat> what I would like to put it this way. Uh, don't hesitate to meet uh, or uh, talk to your oncologist on a regular basis. We keep meeting our uh, cardiologist for our uh, uh, good health of our heart. We need to uh, keep meeting oncologist for good health of uh, uh, from the cancer perspective also. So, uh, these fears uh, should uh, decrease and then uh, we should keep meeting our oncologist more to discuss uh, about uh, uh, early diagnosis, awareness programs and everything. Right. That's an interesting one. Um, on that, actually, I would want to say that for breast cancer, we find that quite a few times, and if anybody wants to comment on it, you can. We find that uh, obviously the first point of call for most patients is the gynecolo gynecologist, right? So, um, and there have been cases where it's not been picked up by the gynecologist. So, anything that can be done or should be done to ensure that. Uh, you know, the gynex don't just treat it as hormonal and uh, send the person back. Uh, so is there anything that is being done or should be done? Anybody wants to comment on that? I think, you know? uh, yeah, please, go please. please go ahead. So I think uh, every, I mean, ladies, they go to a gynecologist during uh, their uh, I mean reproductive age uh, time so I think that uh, they, during the routine checkup they can teach them uh, regarding breast self-examination that is if routinely they do it they, I think most of the uh, female will be covered with this uh, breast self-examination 
Definitely right. I think it might help. Routine, along with the, suppose patient has come for a antenatal checkup, along with right. they give ultrasound, other uh, investigation, whatever uh, required. Along with that, also if they keep it in point, that breast self-examination is one yeah. of the point if they mention, then I think that can make a little difference. I think in some countries, the the practice guidelines for gynac is whenever a woman after a certain age goes to see them, they do uh, say they will do a clinical breast exam. So some countries do have that norm. Um, Dr. Sharath, you wanted to say something else? No, lost him. Okay. Um, Dr. Kashyap, any final words? Uh, even for metastatic breast cancer, we have lots of things. And uh, we as a team, surgeon, radiation, medical oncologist, palliative care physician, counselor, survivor, everything. We have everything uh, for even for metastatic patients. And regarding uh, uh, early diagnosis, I just want to say at present, government has no package in Aishman for some intervention like for biopsy, for breast lump or mammography. Hopefully, right. uh, as Tata Memorial and uh, Ames Delhi are uh, making it, and I am alumni, so I am very much confident that soon in few months or year, this thing will be coming. So that issue will be shorter. And second point that like uh, what we do in uh, delivery, uh, child delivery, Mitanin and other, uh, Asha and other social worker, which have uh, increased the thing. And uh, they are the main uh, highlight because we as doctor are few only. Okay. Counselor like Gurmi Madam and you have better reach. I think you will be the ideal person for that. more aware. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jadunath? Yes, uh, I think uh, one thing is that uh, we uh, that uh, discussed earlier, I just want to mention that we should not be, we have to tell the public that we should not be afraid of cancer. We should not fear cancer, but we should fear late diagnosis, delayed diagnosis. So right. only if, and we have to tell that cancer is curable, provided we can diagnose it in early stage. So if we can create the awareness, you can involve everyone, electronic or printed media, even everyone. You train ASA worker also. Then I think that uh, this scenario will change. We'll go for, I mean, we'll get a lot of, I mean, this uh, diagnosis, one third or two third early stage. We can convert it to from one third to two third and uh, we can get, I think, better survival. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Kalita, any final words from you? Yeah, education is the ultimately the best. Uh, best policy because nobody can detect the, uh, uh, the breast cancer other than the patient uh, uh, herself. So how to examine the breast, uh, what is self-breast examination, it has to be taught from the school school life. So I, should, I, I think that it, it, it has to be included uh, in the curriculum. So uh, how we can detect uh, the, uh, not only breast cancer, any cancer at an early stage, it is very, very important. And second part is that because the, after you detect it, do not fear, do not hesitate to come to the doctor because the chances of getting cured, we have seen that in, in stage 1A, in, in very early breast cancer, the 10-year survival rate with the best possible treatment is more than 95%. So right. do not fear, do not, uh, do not hide your disease. It's It's Say disease like any other disease, you can discuss with the doctor. You, you should come forward. You should come uh, to a local local health practitioner so that he or she can guide you. And thirdly, the cost of the medicine, the cost of the chemotherapeutic drugs, so and 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 some targeted agent has to be decreased. So, uh, so that more and more people uh, can use it and it it can be uh, accessible to most of the uh, patient population. So these are the three points I'd like to highlight. Right, right. Uh, Urviji, anything that you would want to add? I would request our viewers to uh, encourage at least two women to go for mammography as per the guidelines. Right. Awareness. 
right thank you thank you yes i think each one take one kind of uh, <laughs> schemes we need for that uh, and i think you don't need anybody else to do the self test exam so please uh, start to do that uh, we've got one quick question that has come in can cancer spread while on chemo anybody wants to take that sometimes question? yes it is I okay, I told you earlier also that you know, we had a patient with breast cancer. Uh, she was post operative after uh, operation. She was getting chemotherapy. She was HER2 positive, and she complained of minor like forgetfulness. So we got had brain metastasis. So while on treatment, she developed brain metastasis. So it is yes, it is possible. It is it is possible, right? Okay. Uh, so thank you so much, each one of you. I know it's uh, you know it is very thank busy, busy times, and it is still important for us to do this. And I think, as Dr. Jadunath said, it shouldn't only be in October. Uh, it should be a year-round activity. So um, I think let's each one of us take make the effort to do it and to find ways of reaching uh, large parts of the country which are not you know watching this as well. Um, and as I think, as all the panelists have said, that early diagnosis in, improves your chances. So don't fear uh, that early diagnosis better than delaying it. Uh, and so, and you know, October is a good month to remind you that if you haven't scheduled and you are due for a mammogram, then you should get it done. If you're anyway, you haven't learned how to do self breast exam, please do learn and start doing it. Uh, and uh, yeah, and if you're diagnosed uh, or screened and find something suspicious, please go ahead with the whole diagnostic process and treatment. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. And thank you to our audience as well for uh, listening in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.